Welcome back to the podcast for Cultural Reformation, brought to you by the Ezra Institute. Welcome back, one and all, to the podcast for Cultural Reformation, brought to you by the Ezra Institute and uh, also living on the Fight, Laugh, Feast Network. I'm Ryan Aris, and it is my great privilege this week to have a special guest on our show. This is Dr. Vishal Mangalwadi. Uh, he is a philosopher and a social reformer. Dr. Mangalwadi studied philosophy in India at the University of Allahabad uh, and the uh, University of Indore. He's the author of several books, including The Book That Made Your World, How the Bible Created the Soul of Western Civilization, and also The Third Education Revolution. He's been the director and founder of several relief and reform movements and organizations around the world. And this week, he's here in Ontario uh, for a series of lectures that are being uh, toured around, uh, described as a manifesto for ailing nations, rediscovering the healing power of the gospel for our times. And Dr. Mangalwadi, uh, welcome to the show. It's a privilege to, uh, to have you here. Thank you very much. I'm honored. Well, it's uh, it's as I said, it's a uh, it's a real real privilege, and I was hoping to uh, to talk about a few different things. Uh, we were talking uh, before the show, uh, but uh, my my interest as I was uh, as I was preparing this, I was as I was listening to uh, some of your material reading over some of your material um i'd like to i'd like to start uh by hearing more about the third education revolution thank you uh, the first education revolution in europe began in the ninth century with uh, emperor charlemagne mm. um what is known as the Carolingian Renaissance. Um, Charlemagne uh, had revived the Roman Empire. He was a Frankish king. Uh, the Pope made him the emperor, Holy Roman Emperor, because the Roman Empire had disintegrated centuries before him. So as a Christian emperor, he thought his job was to convert everybody. And he thought that uh, to convert means to baptize people. So he told the pagans, uh, German barbarians, that you get baptized, otherwise off with your head. Elquin was a Christian philosopher, theologian, who, was, uh, who had gone to Rome to visit the Pope, and he was on his way back and took a detour to meet Charlemagne. And when he realized that Charlemagne was... Uh, converting people by uh, forcefully baptizing them. Uh, Charlemagne said, wait a minute, this is not conversion. Hmm. Uh, uh, salvation is by faith. Faith comes from hearing, hearing from the word of God, which is the truth. So it is the knowledge of the truth, receiving truth, the seed of God's word, uh, as the sower sows the seed, uh, we plant the truth, the seed of truth in people's heart. So to convert is to educate. Now, this mm. is what St. Boniface had already said 200 years earlier to, in Germany, that to convert is to educate. Um, and once Charlemagne understood that not baptism, but education, communicating the truth, teaching truth to people. Uh, the church is called to bear witness to the truth. This is what saves people. So that began the first education revolution, uh, which climaxed in the founding of the universities, first mm -hmm. in Bolivia, Italy, and then, which was a law university, then Montpellier in France, which was a medical university and all the other universities. Um, uh, Martin Luther, the Protestant reformers, were, was a professor in Wittenberg University, which had just been started 15 years before Luther was appointed a professor. 
Uh, so th this is 450 years after the uh, founding of the universities. So this was the first uh, education revolution in Europe. But by Luther's time, it had become corrupt because uh, uh, many of the non-Christian ideas got fused uh, with the biblical Christianity, uh, particularly uh, Luther was upset at the prominence that Aristotle had in uh, European universities. So uh, for him, there were three antichrists, uh, different phases of Luther's life, and one of the antichrists in the university was Aristotle. Turkey was another antichrist for Luther, and the Pope was, of course, the first. So uh, he saw uh, Aristotle and the corruption of the university as the Antichrist, that the mind was being deceived. Satan is out to deceive the nations, and the universities have become the source of deception. And, uh, but the important factor that began the second education revolution was a Luther's understanding of priesthood and kingship of all believers. In 1520, he wrote a famous letter uh, to Christian nobility of German nation. Uh, in that, he said that uh, the heart of his argument is that God, the Lamb of God, shed his blood to redeem slaves, slaves of Satan, to make them sons of God. As sons of God, you serve your father. You become his priest. You become a prince. You manage your father's estate. Uh, a son works with his father in his estate, managing it. He, the son knows what father wants and that father's will is done on his estate. This is the role of uh, uh, believers as kings. Uh, that uh, he, he, Jesus is the king of kings. If he's the king of kings, we are the kings. We have to make sure that God's will is being done in our lives and in our sphere of influence. So for Luther, uh, if every uh, Christian is to be a uh, priest and a king doing God's will, you can't do God's will unless you know God's will, unless you know God. To know God, you have to study his word. Therefore, his word should not be in Latin. His word should be in German or English or Finnish or French or Spanish. That began the linguistic revolution in Europe where the vernacular languages were turned through the process of Bible translation into literary language. So the English that we are speaking, um, uh, these were dialects that Wycliffe and his group in Oxford first takes to translate the Bible into English. And then, of course, uh, Wycliffe was before the printing existed, before Gutenberg, so his Bible was never really translated, uh, nearly uh, published. It was hand copied, mm -hmm. uh, but it had a huge impact because Chaucer's uh, poetry, uh, but since printing isn't there, Poetry is the main form of communication and drama. So Chaucer's poetry, his language is Wycliffe's language. Uh, but later, uh, after printing, uh, 130 years later or 140 years later, T T William Tyndale translates the New Testament into English. And he ha but he does it in, he first goes to Wittenberg under Luther, then he comes to Belgium, and he prints there, and he has to smuggle it into England because uh, uh, printing and distributing English Bible was banned, illegal, and for the uh, committing the crime of translating and publishing the Bible, uh, uh, Tyndale paid with his life. Mm -hmm. So, but it was Tyndale's English, which is the foundation of our English, because it went through Geneva Bible, other Bibles, and find the King James Bible, um, which was the authorized English translation, but 80-90% uh, of the King James Bible was really Tyndale's English. So modern English, you know, like Shakespeare's English is Geneva Bible, 
because Shakespeare, Geneva Bible came out just, uh, I think, two years before uh, Shakespeare died. So uh, the Geneva Bible was the uh, the language and the worldview uh, was what shaped much of early literature, like Bunyan, etc., but also in uh, America, American Revolution, uh, American revolutionaries were nurtured on Geneva Bible, which was a Republican Bible. Uh, King James Bible was more a, a monarchy, uh, kingship. Uh, uh, so the cultural, Im linguistic impact, cultural, political impact of the Bible translations was huge. But so the, the, Luther's understanding that if every child is to be a priest and king, every child has to be educated. Uh, and that began to transform Protestant nations because the church was educating nations. And the purpose of education is that they might know God, serve God, do his will on this earth. Uh, this began to create free and prosperous nations because uh, Wycliffe had already understood um, uh, when he does his translation in the uh, 1384 edition, which is a handwritten edition, uh, he writes that phrase which later, later Abraham Lincoln quotes, government of the people, for the people, by the people. Uh, in Wycliffe's English, uh, there is no use of the article the. So it is government of people, for people, by people. And the Bible translation, uh, which is includes the linguistic uh, revolution that instead of Latin uh, or Greek, English is now the language of God's word. Uh, the, the Wycliffe's point is that you cannot have government of the people, for the people, by the people, unless it functions in the language of the people. Mm -hmm. So the heart language of the people has to become the language of learning, language of education, language of research, of publication, of laws, of governance. Uh, uh, if the government and uh, courts are running in Latin, then it cannot be government of the people. So th this uh, was the uh, second revolution, and we are all products of that second linguistic revolution, but that revolution has now been corrupted. Hmm. The university has become the source of darkness, intellectual darkness in Europe, in uh, North America, USA, Canada. Uh, the university is the source of intellectual darkness. And um, you have professors and you have highly educated people who do not know what is a boy and what is a girl, what is a man, what is a woman, what is sex and what is love and what is marriage and what is divorce what is uh, a family, what is a nation. Um, so so, so the, the university movement has become dark, darkness, mm -hmm. and is spreading darkness, and the Western university is corrupting the whole world. Uh, therefore, a third education revolution has become necessary, in which the church will take education back from the state. The, the, the hmm. education is still called a ministry. You have the ministry of education That's because right. it was a service the church was rendering. It's a ministry. Uh, but it is now a totalitarian control of ideas. Uh, the, the university professors are no longer free to speak the truth. If they speak the truth, they will be disciplined they will be, uh, I mean, thankfully, the law doesn't allow a tenured professor to lo lose his job. But if he, he's a lecturer, not get, a, not get a tenured professor, he will never become a professor mm -hmm. uh, because this is ideologically controlled centers of darkness that the Western universities have become. So uh, the third education revolution is an attempt to take education back uh, from the state uh, uh, and restore it to the church and make it a means uh, of uh, educating 
the next generation in truth and shaping the character. If every child is to become godlike, the image of Christ is to be formed in every child. State education cannot do that. It will shape the young people into the image of uh, the devil. Um, but uh, to sh uh, make people godly, it, it is the responsibility of the church. This is why the gifts of the Spirit, including the gift of teaching, are given so that characters of the next generation is shaped. So technologically, it is uh, possible now for the church to fill uh, the earth with the knowledge of God. And uh, the proposal is very simple, that we create uh, the world's best curriculum, upload it online, give the school curriculum for free. So from uh, kindergarten to grade 12, all of the uh, curriculum uh, created by, by world experts is given for free to rich and poor uh, in, in their own languages for free. And then uh, the church trains academic pastors, like uh, any large church has missions pastor or music pastor or a uh, women's pastor, a children's pastor. The church must have academic pastor. Academic pastor is like a homeschooling mother, a homeschooling father, who is not just schooling his own children, but also neighbors. So he's meeting in the church if the home doesn't have enough space and the children are coming there. Uh, so the children are growing up Monday to Friday in the church uh, and uh, studying. Uh, there will need to be some practical subjects, which could be, so if you're learning violin uh, or in learning Chinese, you might go uh, to the home of the one who is teaching you Chinese or teaching you um, violin or whatever. So some practical subjects, if you're learning cooking or how to decorate cakes, uh, you might do, uh, have your sessions in a bakery or mm. in a private home. So, but... Um, but if you're studying medicine um, in any church in Canada, you can uh, study brain surgery uh, through virtual reality in, in 3D, in a metaverse. You can go into the uh, surgical theaters of the best, best brain surgeons anywhere in the world um, in, in, in virtually and observe brain surgery. So the theory happens in the church, but to actually do the practice, you have to go into the hospital and um, first observe and then do. Mm -hmm. um, if you're learning how to deliver babies, uh, you can uh, watch a thousand babies being delivered uh, in a church uh, in a 3D um, metaverse, uh, but then you have to go to the hospital so the church, the university, medical university, hospital, working together to, where a student learning how to deliver babies goes to the hospital. And once you have delivered 100 babies, you are certified that now you become an expert in this, that, and the other. So uh, this is a revolution in that the church will take education back from the state. And church will mentor the next generation, both in terms of teaching the truth and in, in terms of for uh, shaping Christ-like character. So veritas, truth, and virtue, character formation, uh, is the responsibility of the church. Mm -hmm. Church is the pillar and foundation of the truth. And th this is uh, what the third education revolution is all about. The cost of education will come down drastically because the church doesn't need to build special buildings and swimming pools and dormitories. Um, to, uh, so the cost of education will come down. Curriculum come free. It, it, there will be means of uh, revenue generation, but um, essentially the poorest child can stay, get the best education. Uh, is what the third education revolution is all about. Right. What uh, what fascinates me about uh, what I what I've read so far about the third education revolution is that 
it's a uh, it's a holistic movement. Uh, you've mentioned it's uh, it's not shy of making use of modern networking technology and uh, metaverse technology and spaces, uh, but it's also got a a social, a civil, uh, or a familial emphasis on on bringing education to students physically, geographically, where they are. Uh, in most cases, that'll have them continuing to live at home, for example. Uh, and it really kind of seems to be reimagining the concept of a community of learners. Uh, and that will that will have uh, political, legal, uh, familial, and uh, and church implications, I suppose. Yes, you're absolutely right. Um, uh, and it is very self-consciously, Adding the dimension of agriculture, um, em mm. grassroots employment creation, healthcare, home delivery, healthcare. So uh, a student can get a BSc in applied theology and nursing, uh, uh, who takes healthcare to the family. She as uh, so this is a church deacon responsible for health. Uh, trained in BSc in theology and nursing uh, because 70% uh, or so of the patients who go to a hospital don't need to do so. A health uh, professional can go there as in his or her role as a deacon. He's, he or she is under the church, um, but in his role as a nurse a practitioner, uh, he or she is under a, a doctor, a hospital. And now you have a technology where the, the nurse practitioner can draw some blood from your finger uh, and through his uh, smartphone send the information to a lab and get the result you know, immediately of what's the problem with the patient. He or she can have electronic stethoscope where a, a patient uh, heartbeat can be heard by the doctor. The doctor may be 500 miles away, uh, kilometers away in his clinic, uh, but the he can hear the heartbeat. Uh, so uh, the, the EKG machines can be taken into homes, um, and a lot of things which are happening in the hospitals, uh, etc., can happen at home. So this would be all part of the training, and this is related to theology because uh, the nurse practitioner can uh, request the patient or the family if he or she can pray for them. And if there is a problems of relationships that are causing, say, heart attack or blood pressure or whatever, uh, those relationships might uh, not, re uh, not require medication, but uh, counseling and prayer. If th there could be demon possession, in um, many uh, situations which you're not supposed to talk about demons and uh, you're not supposed to deal with the demonic activity that happens uh, which causes sickness but the uh, with the permission of the patient the family these people can pray and if they there is a situation which they cannot handle they can request the church elders to come and pray uh, for the family for their situation. So bring holistic uh, healing uh, into every home where there, there will be patients who will need to go to the to a hospital for surgery, et cetera. But, uh, but the same is true of agriculture. The, about a month ago, six weeks ago, when UN 67th <coughs> session of the uh, UN Commission on Status of Women uh, our, uh, the first part of our new book was released. This book is called The Girl, Girl, Abort or Empower Her. And the central point of that uh, uh, new book is that if countries like India, countries in Africa, uh, South America, if they have to be empowered and transformed, women have to be empowered. In most of these places, uh, like 70% of India still lives in the village. And you do not have, the government does not have the capacity to build a school in a village. 
even if you can build a primary school, you can't build a high school in every village. And girls cannot go to the next village or five miles, 10 miles away to attend a high school. They will be kidnapped. They will be raped in most countries. Mm -hmm. uh, and particularly college, you can't build colleges in every village. So uh, the girls are deprived of growth and development. But technology allows you to take the education into the girl's home or girl's ch local church. A, a Muslim girl can walk uh, or bicycle to the local church and attend classes there under an academic mentor. So uh, practically speaking, the old system of government putting up schools and colleges uh, is neither possible nor necessary because much better education, uh, quality of education can be given online in every church. Hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, libraries don't, you, you don't need to build libraries now because any student can access the world's best libraries on his phone. Uh, some of these libraries require payment. The church can make the payment and make those libraries accessible to students. So uh, th this is, uh, yes, harnessing the best available educational technology today, uh, but taking it to the people through the local church. Uh, this is important because a, a student, let's say, for whatever reason, is a slow learner. The father is drunk, he's beating up his wife, the child is going to bed hungry, he's crying as he goes to sleep. Uh, he, he goes to school and he is, because he's had a messed up night, he's abused, he's teased by friends who are insensitive um, because he's poor. He drops out of school. You don't expect a teacher to go and find that child uh, who has dropped out of school and to restore his self-respect, self-esteem, confidence, to bring that child back to classroom. Uh, because a professional teacher is paid to teach. He's not paid to look after the sheep. He's not a shepherd. But a good shepherd, Jesus said, is the one who will leave the 99 sheep go after the one that is lost, bring him, put him up in his own shoulders and bring him back to the fold. So this is the role of a mother, the role of a father, role of a shepherd, which is nurturing every single child and um, uh, separating the gift of teaching, which is a gift of the spirit, uh, which a mother would pay more attention to a child who is struggling and find ways to make sure that the child understands the mathematics or statistics or psychology or whatever physics that uh, that normally a teacher would not be. You know, the teachers themselves could lose their students because if they are not uh, able to give attention to individual sheep, People, students learn differently. So one person may be able to learn by listening to a lecture or reading a textbook, uh, but the other person might need to have very creative ways of uh, games and gamification of education, etc. Uh, this would become possible on it in a 3D uh, framework. So, so this uh, sticking to the old format. Uh, which is a thousand year old system of education now, uh, which is unnecessary uh, for a number of reasons that I can discuss. Uh, but one of the points that I've just made is that yes, um, in, in, in the United Nations six weeks ago, so when we released our book, um, my argument was that if, if the leadership is really keen uh, to make sure to empower every girl, the, every girl in a village in India cannot be empowered by the system of education that exists today, which requires a school building, which requires a paid teacher, 
this is not possible. What many of the students need is much more uh, than a professional teacher. They need a shepherd. Uh, maybe I should take the time to give a practical illustration. Uh, I was teaching in a university in North India. Uh, one day, one of my students came to me and said, would you like to visit the slum across the river from your home? I said, I would love to do that. Uh, but the river was very dirty. Yamuna River, the university didn't allow us to swim across. So we had to take a bicycle, go around. Uh, over a bridge to the slum. Now, this is right across. I can't see the slum because the river is very uh, wide. When I got there, there was a young man, 17, 18 year old, 17 perhaps, with torn clothes, um, some child, who was educating, uh, teaching about 40 or so kids. They were all sitting on the road. It was a dead end road in a slum. So there was no traffic there. The kids are sitting on the road, no uh, furniture, no carpet, uh, sitting directly on tar road. Mothers and sisters are washing dishes on both sides, cooking dinner, and he's teaching them. The kids are very excited that a university professor has come to visit them. So uh, at the end, they stood up and sang a Christian. They are all from Hindu families. They sang a Christian song for me. Uh, uh, and, but I was very pleased with this young man, who is himself a high school student, uh, does not have clothes, lives uh, very poor, but is spending his evening teaching. So I invited him to come and spend uh, Saturday evening with me. He came, ate, uh, we walked together, then he slept in my home, loved it, and he made it a habit coming every Saturday to visit me. After we had become good friends, he uh, Sunday morning he went to church with me. He, he said to me that, sir, I will not pass my high school examination this year. Why? Because I don't understand math. Why? Because the teacher is doesn't take the trouble to really help those of us who have difficulty with math. Um, there are some students who understand him, but these are the students who take a tuition. His sister, teacher is not allowed to, he's a government salaried teacher. He's not allowed to run private tuitions, but his sister-in-law runs a, a tutorial class. And those who pay her, he teaches them. And they're the ones who understand in the uh, class what's going on. So he said, he added that I, my home is 100 miles away. My father doesn't believe in the village education, uh, village school. He thinks that the city schools may be better. So he sent me here. I live with four other boys from my, my caste. We are low caste. All these four boys are older than me. They have all dropped out of school. Uh, they are working as uh, day laborers, pages, you know, hauling things on their backs, etc. Um, so five of us live in the one room. Television is on 24 hours. I cannot pay attention to my studies. Exams are three months away. I'm sure I cannot catch up and I cannot pass. So I invited him to come and move into my home for the next three months. I had a desktop computer that I was not using. I put him on that. I introduced him to a program called KhanAcademy.com, Khan, K-H-A-N, Khan, uh, Khan Academy, which te was teaching math. Now it teaches many other subjects, and people like Bill Gates. Uh, ironically, Bill Gates' daughter was studying math at the same academy. So here is <laughs> some, some kid in my home who has become a class fellow with Bill Gates' daughter because she was having a hard time uh, studying, understanding math, so Bill Gates got looked into the, on the internet what is there, and when he found Khan Academy, he began introduced it to her daughter, and he began funding Khan Academy, and Warren Buffet and others began funding Khan Academy, and it became a very popular program, uh, which I checked out. So I started this boy uh, in on Khan Academy. 
uh, it was in English at that time. So I had to teach him how to translate uh, using Google Translate the math, English math into Hindi. My dining table became his English language class. And I gave him a bilingual Bible, English and Hindi, so that he can read a page in English and in Hindi, and he can under, begin to understand English. And this is also audio, so he can learn English pronunciations. Uh, and then uh, our dining table, I will uh, we'll take up words, take up ideas, and discuss philosophy, theology, um, social issues, etc. Well. He got so intrigued with Khan Academy that three months later he wrote his exams. The results came two, three months after that. And um, he had passed in first division his high school, and he was convinced that he would fail. Uh, but now I was not teaching him in math. He, I could, didn't pay him for a tutor that you go and take tuition, but I was just a shepherd who is taking an interest in this young man who is now working for Merchant Navy. Uh, so I, I was just taking interest in him. And uh, the uh, one of the best math courses was available to him for free. If someone would take the trouble to introduce it to him, make it possible for him to study. Now, that actually uh, incident takes on lot greater meaning that if you if if you don't mind I'll take another two minutes to explain during the, after he wrote his exams while he's waiting for his results I have asked the university to give him a bicycle there were some bicycles lying around nobody was using he started going to another slum to start uh, teaching those slum kids during his summer months a widow who used to look after her brother who was dying of tuberculosis, plus she had three kids. She was collecting plastic bottles the whole day, garbage collector, to earn a little, uh, make a little money. Illiterate woman. She allowed him to use her front yard. This is a slum, public property anyway, under the tree to teach her kids and 20 other kids from her slum. So someone from Texas, an Indian uh, techie guy from Texas was visiting us. When he saw what this young man was doing, he donated 13 tablets, uh, the, the, because buying wholesale directly from the manufacturer. They were very cheap, just about $30, $40. He bought them gave them to us. Now, the slum had no electricity. It had no internet connection. So the uh, tablets had to come to my home every uh, evening to be recharged. We uploaded them. Uh, the government approved curriculum, kindergarten through 12. So two boys or girls, seven years old, will use one tablet to take the same lesson. So the 20, 30 kids are divided into small groups using one tablet, helping each other to learn. So one 18, by now he's definitely 18, one 18-year-old young man is educating at the same time 20 slum kids. Uh, they, he, they don't need the internet because we have uploaded uh, the curriculum into the tablet. And... Um, uh, so he, they're learning technology. They're learning the discipline of studying themselves, helping each other. Now, the most interesting part of it is that I had a friend, South Indian friend, who, uh, who, and I had helped this couple start a school which is running very well today with a 1,000 kids. Uh, this lady who died of COVID, she sent it to a big jar of fish pickle. Fish pickle is a South Indian dish. We don't make that or we can't buy it in North India. But this friend of mine, the uh, slum boy, 
who has become a shepherd, he loved that fish pickle so much that he wanted to learn how to make it and eat it every day. So I said, well, it's not good enough if you learn how to make it. Why don't you have that widow who's given you her front yard, let her learn. She's living on the river bank. Every day there is fish market above her slum on the main road. She can buy fish there, make fish pickle. You sell fish pickle, package it and sell it. He loved the idea. So I gave him an advance of 100 or 200 rupees to buy oil and spices and buy the fish. Where will she learn? She doesn't have a kitchen. She lives in a one mud, a one room mud hut. Well, we requested some ladies in our university uh, uh, if they would teach her how to make fish pickle. So they did. They were very happy to help at this good project. So, but then where is she going to make fish pickle in a hygienic way? Because she doesn't have a kitchen. So when I'm teaching in the university, they can use my kitchen. So she, she, they learn with these professional teachers how to make fish pickle. They used my kitchen to make the fish pickle. This young man was very happy to sell because he made little money and uh, he got to eat fish pickle every day. So <laughs> this is combined. This is holistic education, where uh, this woman now who is collecting garbage, she begins to make fish pickle. She can make chili pickle, or mango pickle, or lemon pickle, or all sorts of things once she has learned it. My my uh, kitchen has become a community kitchen for her and two, three other women who were coming and when they can to, to, manu to become manufacturing. So now this is part of agricultural education to add value. They don't have a farm. They are not farming. Uh, they, they are not fishermen um, or fisherwomen, but uh, there are things that they can do the poorest people, illiterate people can do. If we give them the money, the loan, let's say we organize them into an agri uh, community where they can borrow money to buy fish and buy the spices and uh, learn packaging and marketing, uh, where the cooperative, the church is has shepherds who are helping these people. Um, then what happens is she's, if she's repaying the money regularly from her little microfinance, she has earned the credit that when her child needs a computer, she can borrow money from the cooperative to buy a computer for her child, and she repays um, on a regular basis. So here is a slum child whose mother is a widow, single mom, collecting garbage. But if he really studies science and math and the Bible and everything else, tomorrow he wants to go to uh, NASA to study rocket science. Can a slum kid from India go and study rocket science? Yes. If the church is a cooperative, uh, building up the family, the family's capacity, including training them the discipline to borrow and repay faithfully, but making sure that they have a means of making money to repay. So this is all part of education, third education revolution, mm -hmm. which is integrated in the family uh, and local church structure. What, what we have got to do, I mean, initially at the time of Martin Luther, all the teachers were priests. The pastor was the teacher, Monday to Friday. That pastoral role, the academic pastor, the pastoral role, the shepherd role, is what is needed to transform these slums and these villages and the poor. Right. 
it's uh, again go, getting back to you've you've done a uh, a marvelous job of laying out all of the all of the implications in other spheres. Uh, it, it strikes me that uh, we you've called this an educational revolution, uh, where it uh, you almost could have just as uh, just as comfortably referred to it as a a family or a church or a commercial uh, revolution. Uh, is there a is, is there a reason or what what uh, what prompted you to identify education uh, as the the entry point for cultural reform in in as in so far well, as it spills because, over into so many other areas uh, uh, martin luther uh, uh, was very clear this is 1520s uh, when he is saying that next to the reform of the church europe's biggest need is reform of education hmm. because he sees aristotle as the antichrist who is corrupted, uh, who is corrupting the West European mind. So education revolution was from the beginning ministry of the church. The, the idea that the church should not be educating, but the state should be educating, this is part of a theological corruption of the Western church. It, it, so for a thousand years, well, actually more than a thousand years, uh, from when the Irish monks began going to England and uh, Germany and Switzerland and France, the Irish monks were the main educators. Monasteries, mm. nunneries were the main centers of education. There was no school system. Uh, then the universities emerged after the Carolingian Renaissance, 200 years or so after Car Carolingian Renaissance. And then uh, by, after 1520, uh, when Luther calls for universal education, uh, the, the church is the, is the only community that has educated leaders. Priests are educated. So the he means the priests have to educate. Mm -hmm. And uh, th 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 so the education is ministry of the church. In Europe, only after Napoleon, after 1832, that the church begins to hand over education to the state. There were practical reasons, but there were theological reasons. Mm -hmm. In America, that is United States of America, the state begins to take over the education only after 1850s. Um, the most important person there was Horace Mann, right. M-A-N-N. -double -N. Horace Mann was the uh, secretary to the Board of Education in the state of Massachusetts. He began to argue that the church should not educate, state should educate. His argument was uh, mainly doctrinal, that if the church educates, church will teach divisive doctrines such as Trinity. Mm -hmm. A student doesn't need to learn Trinity. A student needs to learn that he should honor his father and his mother, that he should not steal his friend's food or pencil or paper. Uh, so yes, the Bible should be taught, Ten Commandments should be taught uh, to teach ethics, but the Bible should not be taught to teach doctrines, teach, teach truth, because these are divisive doctrines. Now, he was a Unitarian. Uh, this was part of the Enlightenment's right. uh, impact that uh, I can't believe in Trinity. I'm a Unitarian. Uh, that had already happened. Unitarianism had taken over um, uh, Harvard University in 1805, the mm. board of Harvard, uh, and following that, a number of other colleges, universities had become Unitarians. So he's arguing that although the church is running all the educational institutions, there's no need for church to run these educational institutions because then the church will teach these divisive doctrines. Now, in, I think it was in 1848 or so he became a congressman, won the seat in House of Representatives. 
and that gave him a national platform to champion that the church should not educate, the state should. Now, for different in inner weakness, theological reasons, American church had embraced anti-intellectualism, particularly after D.L. Moody. And the church had abandoned, the Protestant churches start, started all the colleges and universities, but the church abandoned uh, uh, the, the pursuit of the mind, that mind is made in God's image. To be godly means to cultivate your mind, this Augustinian idea which was at the root of Christian education, that had, this had been undermined. So the church went along with his teaching, and particularly uh, the practical situation was uh, eight, 1892 or so is when John Dewey uh, came to Chicago to begin his experimental education, and he became the most important uh, philosopher of education in, uh, in the USA. Uh, of the first first world war world war became the turning point because after the war uh, many war veterans these were young men who returned from the war and when they returned to the USA they found that women had taken over the job that men used to do women were driving buses and trucks and taxis and they were uh, running banks and post offices so men didn't have the works that they would have normally had, had. And they couldn't go back to their father's farm because now machines were milking cows. So what do they do? They have to be re-educated to do something else. That means we need colleges, vocational colleges. Church, the American church by that time had embraced anti-intellectualism and pessimism and didn't see uh, it, uh, that it is our responsibility to start colleges and educational programs for these young men. State should do so. Dewey then went on to use the uh, doctrine of separation of church and state, bring it into education, that the doctrine of church and state, separation of church and state means that State should educate, but state should not teach the Bible. Because you should honor your father and your mother is common sense. Uh, no, Dewey was not a Unitarian. He was a pragmatist. So right. pragmatism, what works, what is good. Well, family works if the children honor their father and their mother. So yes, of honoring your father and mother is a moral value, but it is not God's word. This is a common sense, pragmatic value. So the, the theological degeneration of the church in North America made it possible for people like Dewey to read into the principle of separation of church and state this principle of separation of God and education, separation of God and justice, God and um, human rights or whatever, uh, all of secularization of society uh, was an abuse. Now, part of it, why this happened um, uh, in, in North America is a fascinating study, which we should do another podcast on that. Uh, but the summary end result of it is that after World War I, uh, when uh, American church, the eschatology changed and ecclesiology changed, the church embraced these foolish ideas that states should educate, church should not educate. So, so why am I emphasizing education? as a means of reform, because this was uh, from the very beginning, from European background, uh, and it goes back to the Ju Jewish background, because 2,000 years ago, uh, Israel, the Jewish community, was the only community in the whole world where a carpenter's son, a fisherman's son, a shepherd's child knew how to read and write. Right. 
because uh, uh, where would a carpenter's son go to study, learn how to read and write Torah? He will go to the synagogue. Mm -hmm. The priest is priest on Sabbath. He on Sunday or Monday, five days a week. He is a teacher. He's the one who is teaching a fisherman's son to learn how to read and write. This revolution came to India only the last 60, 70, 100 years that a fisherman's son, a shepherd's son can become an educated professor, a learned man. So th this was all, always, so th this, uh, it had become, begun, begun 3,000 years ago, but we don't need to go back into that history. <laughs> so th this was a Jewish tradition where God picks up a bunch of slaves that I want to transform you into a great nation, a wise nation. What does he do? He gives them a written text, the Ten Commandments and other books. Uh, these people are illiterate. They are shepherds and they are brick makers. Why are you giving them a written text? Why don't you just tell them stories? Well, God doesn't just tell them stories. He gives them a written text because God is not an American. He never studied in American missionary training programs, which will <laughs> emphasize uh, orality and storying. Right, that right. You don't give written text to illiterate people. God gave a written text to illiterate people because he required them to learn how to read. How to copy. You make copies of this law. They complained. Uh, we don't have pen and paper. How can we copy? So God says, now don't complain. You write it on your doorpost, on your walls. Your women stitch your clothes. Teach them to write. They will stitch these laws in your clothes. Because mm. if these law is everywhere, the objective is that you meditate upon it day and night. You... If Pharaoh wants you to be a brick maker, I want you to be a thinker. You mm. think about my word day and night. That's the way to internalize. My objective is that my law is written in your heart. It shapes your mind and character. And so you have to be able to read it, copy it, meditate upon it, and teach it. You should be a shepherd, but a professor shepherd. Your dining table should be an occasion where your children and grandchildren are learning history, learning the interpretation of history, and learning the truths that I've taught you. So this was the transformation that God was bringing about amongst the Jews uh, to make a bunch of slaves into a great nation. And the Protestant tradition received this from the Old Testament, from the Jewish tradition, and that's what made the Protestant nations the strongest nation. Hmm. But after World War I, the Protestant nations gave up their heritage, and now they are becoming slaves in Canada. Well, the freedom of thought is being, is being robbed. The freedom of speech is being taken away. Um, your mind is your real wealth. Freedom of thought is the essence of freedom. So religious freedom is the essence of freedom. And uh, the and the secular state would colonize your heart and your mind, rob you of your freedom to think your own thoughts. Because once the truth has disappeared, from the universities, then scientists become myth makers. Hmm. And hmm. the state loves these myth makers because uh, the, they authorize the state to uh, put uh, diapers on everyone's mouth in the name of COVID. Uh, even if there is no scientific basis for um, putting masks on, or taking, uh, requiring vaccine, etc. Um, the so when when you have no genuine scientific basis, when scientists are still researching whether this vaccine is effective 
whether this vaccine is actually uh, safe. Um, but that debate is not allowed. It's not allowed in academic um, uh, circles, in scientific circles, uh, because the uh, secular state does not understand freedom. That science grows through discussions, disagreements, debates, uh, but they believe in stifling and enslaving because uh, there is no God above uh, the state which can reveal truth. Therefore, the state has to use scientists, turn them into myth makers who will help the, uh, the state to colonize and slave the people. The, the whole biblical tradition of setting people free was through the freedom of the mind, which is what is investigation. Truth is something that you can investigate and debate. Myth is something which you're forced to believe. You're not allowed to question. And that's what has been happening to Canada. And that's why the third education revolution, which will, uh, will, which will the church will reaffirm that the church is baptized with the spirit of truth. It doesn't mean that everything that the church believes and teaches is true, but it means that the church is responsible to seek truth, to bear witness to the truth. It is baptized with the spirit of truth. Uh, state is not baptized with the spirit of truth. Now, this has practical consequences. And if you have a few more minutes, I'll uh, give you a very important practical implication that both Canada and the United States and Europe are facing now, which is that some of your most learned people have made themselves incapable of defining what is a woman. Right. This is the end of the feminist era where feminists cannot define what a woman is. Why can't they define a woman? The reason is that you can only define a female in con comparison or contrast to male. That means male and female have to be different. You can only define a woman in contrast to a man. That means they have to be different. If they are different, can they be same? Can they be equal? For the secular mind, no. If they are different, they cannot be equal because that's not logical. Mm -hmm. In the necessity to affirm the sameness and equality of male and female, they cannot say that a female is different than a male. Now, Islam doesn't have this problem. Islam says women and men and women are not equal. Right. Women are in, females are inferior. So uh, they don't have that problem. Hinduism doesn't have that problem because uh, in Hinduism, uh, a soul which whose karma were poor in previous life reincarnates as a female. So a female is a inferior soul with right. poor yeah. karma. If she serves me well in this life. She might be reborn as a male next in next life. So uh, equality of male and female is not the self-evident truth to a Muslim or a Hindu, if he is a real Hindu or a real Muslim, not a Canadian. Um, but secularists have a real problem. The secular university has a real problem. If it insists on equality and sameness of male and female, it cannot say that they are distinct and they're, therefore, uh, because they, uh, male and female being different means that one, they are not equal. Now, Christianity did not have this problem because of Trinity. That's right. If Trinity is the ultimate reality of this universe, your triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three persons, one God. Unity and diversity exists at the core of the universe, cosmos. Then it's not a problem 
that a triune God makes man in his image, male and female, for two of them to be one, so that they become three, have a baby. Uh, the, the family is made in God's image. The, 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 yes, men and women are same, they are equal, but they are different. Uh, was not an intellectual problem in a Christian culture, Christian Canada. But once you have given up Trinity, which is what Horace Mann was saying, that is, child doesn't need to be taught Trinity. But when a child is not taught Trinity, he has no intellectual basis, rational, logical basis, to say that male and female are distinct. They are separate. Uh, they are different. But they are equal. Just as Father and Son and the Holy Spirit are distinct, different, but equal. One God. Uh, so, uh, in uh, undermining the revealed truth, such as Trinity, secular education has actually made a fool of Western intelligentsia. It has made them incapable of affirming unity and diversity, that men and women are different. Therefore, we can define a woman, but they are same they're equal in their dignity in being made in God's image. So th this is why the church has to take education back from mm -hmm. the state to be able to teach truth. Right. Well, amen. May it, uh, may it be so. I hope that, uh, I hope that many will, uh, will hear this message. Dr. Vishal Mangalwadi, thank you so much for being on the show. A uh, reminder to all who are listening, uh, you'll be here in Ontario, uh, April 23rd through 28th, uh, a lecture series, uh, The Manifesto for Ailing Nations, Rediscovering the Healing Power of the Gospel for Our Times, speaking on uh, the role of the Christian university, uh, the role that the Bible played in shaping Western culture, and many other related themes. I've really enjoyed our conversation together today. And I, uh, I hope that, uh, as you mentioned, that we can have a second podcast sometime. That would be uh, that'd be a real sure. pleasure. Wonderful. Sure. Thank you. So, so actually, I'm on this uh, tour till the 30th of April. In oh, Ontario. is it the 30th? Okay. And I've then, got old information yeah, then. then on, Excellent. Uh, then first and second, uh, we will have a retreat uh, near, near you in Niagara, somewhere in the Niagara area. Uh, to launch the third education revolution in Canada. Um, and then on the third, I will be in London, Ontario, uh, speaking to the Christian Legal Association, um, the Christian lawyers. So that'll be, oh, wonderful. that's not part of this tour, but I'm in the area till the third of uh, May. Excellent. And my wife is with me. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's the best way to travel with your wife. Excellent. Yes, which keeps me in shape. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Vishal Mangalwadi, thanks so much for being on the show. I remind everyone who's listening that uh, this has been the podcast for cultural reformation and that from him and through him and to him, that's Jesus Christ, are all things. May God alone be glorified and we'll look forward to being with you again next week. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.